I was there for the 2013 negative trials, and I was also there for the 2015 positive trials. And what that is, is a lesson in the, the downside of evidence, because if the trial is not perfectly designed, you can get results which are not reflective of reality. But if you have a disease state which is extremely heterogeneous, both in terms of its manifestations, its anatomy, its pathophysiology, its presentation, and its treatment options. So I think we need to think of different ways of gathering data because the limiting factor of evidence-based medicine is that you have to create selection criteria. And you and I, when we are in practice, we don't have selection criteria. We have the patient who walks through our door. So most rigorous randomized trials exclude a significant proportion of patients. And therefore, I really believe registries need to be conducted alongside randomized trials because you need to know the entirety of the data set. This is really important for us to establish level one evidence through randomized controlled trials for medium and distal vessel occlusions because these are the populations of cases where intravenous thrombolytic therapy is highly effective as well. And so the question is, what is the risk benefit ratio in doing endovascular therapy for medium and distal vessel? We started thinking of a concept called first pass effect. So what that means is that you're essentially able to go in there and take the entire clot out on your first pass. We identified that as an independent direct predictor of excellent outcome, which means that our goal as neurointerventionalists really is to be able to get complete or near complete recanalization on our first attempt. We started off with stent retrievers, and then we did aspirations, then we started complaining stent retriever and aspiration, then we thought balloon guides are really good. Now we're starting to develop concepts such as embolic protection, even super large bore catheters. I think these are all novel concepts trying to improve that first pass effect. No question, better tools are important. But you have to understand what are you dealing with. So there are two two components of stroke which are uniquely important. One is the anatomy, so the tortuosity, the access, the branching point, the angulation of the M1 to the M2 and the M1 to the ICA. The second component is what is the factor that's causing the occlusion, the clot characteristics. Now, I led, uh, along with Tommy Anderson and Raul Noguera, excellent registry and we just extended that registry from excellent one to excellent two. For, we did a thousand patients, we're adding another thousand patients specifically looking at clots and their relationship to the strategy that was utilized. And it looks like that if you're using stent retrieval, which is what we did for the first thousand patients, it was hard to ascertain the value of stent retrieval as more effective or less effective depending on the type of clot there was. For the next thousand patients, we are specifically starting to look at ICAD, we're starting to look at um, aspiration, we're looking at super large bore, we're looking at balloon guides. So when you combine all these tools, I expect that we might see, we might see, I'm not sure, that for a red clot, it's better to do this, but for a white clot, it's better to do that. So if I had to summarize the main goals of the Excellent Registry, that is to understand the impact of clot type on the efficiency of the thrombectomy procedure. And a corollary to that is selection of the right tools for the right clot. And so what we're doing is a massive data gathering exercise. It's an international study. And then the second phase that we just launched, it includes significant Asian populations so we can have more ICAD to assess the value of stent retrieval, aspiration, balloon guides, combined, separated, including primary stenting if needed, with the clot type that is removed. I think the goal here would be to understand better the relationship of tool with clot type. I can tell you after the first thousand patients, 
we don't think it does. A thousand patients ago, we were sure it did. So now we'll see what the next thousand patients with a more wider spectrum of tools, see if we will go back to our original assumption or where we are right now. This is the catch-22 because we don't have level one evidence. So in fact, one of the trials I recently proposed in the United States to this national organization called Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute is exactly that randomizing patients to balloon guides versus no balloon guides. Because while we have tremendous evidence of the value of balloon guides, 60% or greater of neurointerventionists in the U.S. do not use it. And I think that is ridiculous unless they are all using large, super large board, which I know they are not. No, I base my decision on intuition. I do try to follow things reasonably, but I'm not dogmatic about following evidence. Um, I think evidence is important, but at the end of the day, you have to try to do the right thing for that particular patient. I try to do whatever is best to get the vessel open. And I have to tell you, my technique, especially with stroke, continues to evolve. Okay, great. Thank you, Anand. My pleasure.